All right. Good morning, everyone. My name is Melissa Cowan, and I am the lead historical interpreter here at Rockledge Ranch. And I am in the blacksmith shop today with um, Mr. Andy Morris. And we're just going to have a great time today for about an hour just looking at um, historically what was the purpose and um, of a blacksmith, what did they do, um, and then we're going to look at, uh, he's already hard at work. He's going to show us about three different projects today. So I'm going to turn this around and we're going to get started. So here is Mr. Andy Moran. Well, good day, everybody. You may have noticed I was beaten on a cold piece of metal and that's something I never really do. I just wanted to start out this program with doing that because there's a saying that you will not, a blacksmith won't make it to heaven if they do two things. And one is beaten on cold metal. The other is not charging enough. So um, we'll get started in a moment and we'll get our fire going. Um, a little bit about myself. This is my 30th year as a blacksmith, believe it or not. I started relatively late. I was 30 years old when I first hit a hot piece of metal and it's something I really enjoyed uh, over the years and I quite honestly can't get enough of it. Um, my background mostly has been in uh, historic demonstrations for the public. I have access to a modern shop where I can use power hammers and plasma cutters and welders and all of those sorts of things but my my expertise, if you will, has been in uh, doing historic demonstrations. And so here in the Rockledge Ranch blacksmith shop, we are in the park of the Garden of the Gods within the city limits of Colorado Springs and at the foot of America's most famous mountain, right, Sun Mountain. That's what the Ute used to call it in their language because the sun coming up in the morning would hit that mountain to start with and of course i'm referring to pike's peak who by the way never did actually climb that peak and historians tend to tease him about that but if you find out if you do some research you'll find out that he really had a he came up from pueblo and it had been a really really snowy uh winter and it was in november and he was trying to climb up there and he got to a false summit and said uh, we can't make it so uh, they named the pike uh, the peak after him uh, anyway even though he never did climb it if, I, if you don't mind, I'll show you some things here that, that we can uh, that we've made here in the shop. This shop represents, by the way, 1890s, and so blacksmithing was still really important. But surprisingly, he didn't make most of the things he worked on from scratch. In other words, he worked on items in a lot of cases that were manufactured, but then he repaired, and that's mostly what a blacksmith in 1890s would have been doing: is repair mass-produced items. But it doesn't mean he wouldn't have made certain things uh, custom, uh, like for instance, branding irons. Those have to be made special to match what the rancher or farmer needed. So those are all done by hand. Some of these things here, for instance, this represents uh, a tool that would have been on a heavy wagon, perhaps in a mine. If this chain would have broke, then uh, they would have brought it to a blacksmith and he maybe would have made a chain to connect the pieces together. Um, horseshoeing. People tend to think that's all a blacksmith did. If Melissa would show this photo up here of a gentleman by the name of Francis Whitaker, he was a true master blacksmith. Believe it or not, he was a blacksmith for 78 years from the time he was 14 to 92. He made a living as a blacksmith. Um, started out as an apprentice, so at that time he wouldn't have been making a living, but he started out as an apprentice and then became a blacksmith. I asked him once how many horseshoes he ever made in 78 years, and he said he never made a horseshoe. So people are surprised sometimes when they, they come in the shop and we're not doing horseshoes. A lot of what we do is represented here on the table. We'll make, our, we'll make hand tools, for instance. A blacksmith is always making his own tools. Even modern blacksmiths should be making their own tools. In some cases, you may make a tool for one project that you'll make that tool for that job and then maybe never use it again. A lot of times people, when I travel, when I'm pheasant hunting or whatever, and I go into historic blacksmith shops in the little towns in the Midwest, occasionally I get to meet somebody who owns a shop and they'll go in and they'll say, I'm really curious. My great uncle 
used to be a blacksmith and what is this tool? And I'll look at it and say, I have no idea. He probably made that tool for a special job that he was working on and I've never seen one like it before. So we'll, we'll repair things like mass produced traps. If the chain breaks, if the spring breaks, this is an example of a repair that a blacksmith would have done. Um, we've made some trivets for the Rockledge Ranch historic site to be used in the historic homes. Uh, made a set of hand irons, um, kind of a fancy roasting fork. And we can even do decorative non-functional things like this rose. Whenever I get in the doghouse with my wife, I tend to make her a rose and it kind of helps. Um, so yeah, she's got this humongous rose tree, if you will. What I'll do is, let, well, let me start before we get going. I want to read to you a poem that I find is my favorite poem ever written in the history of mankind. Guess what the subject matter is? It's called The Village Blacksmith by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. And I'll just start out in the beginning. And then if you're interested, you can look up the rest of the poem. <clears throat> Under a spreading chestnut tree, the village smithy stands. The smith, a mighty man, is he with large and sinewy hands and the muscles of his brawny arms are strong as iron bands. Whew. No wonder if that's my favorite poem. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, look it up. And maybe some of you folks that are uh, having to learn at home instead of going to school, maybe you get extra credit if you um, memorize that poem. And then maybe you can come visit me and read it and recite it for me. So what I'm gonna do, let's get started. You don't wanna just listen to me talk. I'm gonna talk while uh, I'm working. So we'll start a fire. There's a special device that we use to start a fire in 1890s. Um, and I'll teach you how to pronounce it. It's called a match, match. I'm gonna use that to start my fire. So I'm gonna come over here and get some newspaper. We'll start my fire. I'm not using wood. This is a coal fire, but more specifically, it starts out as coke. When you take hardwood and bake it, not burn it, but bake it, that's how you make charcoal. The same process is done with coal. You bake the coal and it turns it into, uh, it turns it into what is called coke. And so here's examples of coke. I don't know if you can tell how light and fluffy that is, but basically all the impurities have been baked out of that. And they tell me that's almost pure carbon. It's like black styrofoam. That's what I want to start my fire. And that's what I want in the middle of my fire because this stuff burns super hot. So sometimes people say that it takes 20 or 30 minutes to get a fire going. And it shouldn't. It should only take a few moments to have coke from the previous fire. And other than the very first fire that you ever start in the forge, you should always have coke because the last thing I do before I put the fire out is make sure I've got plenty of coke. So I will get this fire started. As I mentioned, I've been doing this for 30 years. And over the years, I've had, I've had a lot of questions. And one question that I'll get is, um, People walk into my smithy and say, Mr. Blacksmith, is that a real fire? And I always say, yep. Um, sometimes they'll come in and say, Mr. Blacksmith, do you ever get burned? And I'll always say, yep. Sometimes they'll come in and say, Mr. Blacksmith, do you get tired of answering the same questions all the time? And I always say, nope. It worked a minute ago. I practiced that and I can't get it started. We'll do it this way. So I'll light my paper. Usually I hold it up here so that it gets the flu hot. You may be surprised I'm not using a bellows. This is called a blower. These came about before the Civil War. And of course, as the name implies, it's blowing air in the fire, as you can see. 
I'm adding coke to the fire, but I don't want to smother it. Somebody can keep track of the time that it takes me to start this fire if you want. So this provides the air, the coke provides the fuel, and that match provided the heat. So we've got all three elements for a fire. Blacksmiths, by the way, use all four elements. Probably many of you know what I'm referring to. We use earth, air, fire, and water. I used to tell people we were the only ones that did. And I like to tell the story how one time I was demonstrating in front of a whole bunch of folks outside our doors here. They were looking in and I made that comment that blacksmiths are the only people who use all four elements. And this little lady in the back raised her hand all defiantly and said, no, you're not. And I was taken aback a little bit because she was so confident. And I said, ma'am, is that right? I said, you give me another example of somebody who does. And she said, a potter people that work in clay, and they've been around a lot longer than blacksmiths. And so she's right. Blacksmiths, the earliest recording item made by a blacksmith was about 1300 BC. It was found in an Egyptian tomb. It was a dagger that was made out of iron. That's, I think, still the earliest record of a blacksmith item. So blacksmiths have been around at least 3,000 years. OK, I got a fire going. Another question I'll get it is why aren't you wearing gloves? And the man, Francis Whitaker, that I just introduced you to his pictures on the wall. He never let anybody in his smithy wear gloves. And there was a reason for that. Um, one is you've got a whole lot more control. Here's my glove. You've got a lot more control if you're barehanded. I'll give you, I'll try to illustrate this. If I'm wearing this glove and I'm swinging that hammer, I got that goblet leather in my hand. I can't feel that very well at all. And then also it means that I have to hold on tighter because I have to try to work my hand through the glove to hold that. I mean, that feels strange to me even to demonstrate that. So I'm always barehanded swinging a hammer and I don't wear a glove on my tongue hand either. Another reason is if say I left that piece in there and I'm talking to a group of people and, and a few minutes later I come back over and I uh, say I'm wearing that glove. And I come back over and I grab that. By the time I feel it's hot, I'm going to try to get that glove off. Where if I touch it with my hand, and I never grab it this way because you have a tendency when it's hot to grip it more. You always touch it with the back of your hand. And if it's hot, that won't matter. If I were to grab it like this and it's hot, I could brand myself. And then that a wound that probably will only take a few days to heal might take several weeks because every time I'm swinging the hammer, I'm breaking that scab open. So you touch it with the back of the hand. Those are two reasons. The third reason Francis didn't let people wear gloves in his shop was that he figured if you got burned when you weren't paying attention, then you'd learn to start paying attention. And if you knew Francis, you'd understand. That's, uh, that's the way he did things. I'll tell you what I'm gonna do. Let's, uh, we'll start out with a simple hook. One that I can warm my arm up. We'll start swinging, hitting a piece of metal. Obviously, the metal will get hot. And the miraculous thing with iron and steel is it changes color as it gets hot. Starts out black, red, cherry, orange, yellow, and white, then it burns up. It doesn't melt, it'll burn because I'm putting air in the fire. It'll get so hot it'll be like a sparkler. It'll look like a sparkler if I bring it out and it's that hot and it's throwing sparks around the room. That will ruin a piece if you let it go very long when it's that hot. So, Generally, I'll work it at an orange or a yellow heat. In video, the color seems to be brighter than it really is in real life, in person. Because when I bring this out, I think it's probably gonna look white hot to you, but it's probably gonna be yellow hot to me. So we'll get it, we'll get it hot. And we'll start smiting. By the way, I'm a smiter of black metal. That's where blacksmith comes from. Smiter of gold, goldsmith, tinsmith, locksmith. White Smith, uh, did I say Tin Smith? All Smiths work metal and they use a hammer. If they don't, they're not a Smith. 
You don't call him a woodsmith. You don't call him a wordsmith either for all those folks out there that use that term. smoke that comes off that that green what we call green coal you see the smoke coming off of that that's the process of baking that wet coal turning it into coke I never put that on the top of my fire it's just to the side so it can bake its uh, it can bake into coke I'm gonna put on my protective spectacles in a lot of historic photographs, blacksmiths aren't wearing any kind of protection. Okay, so now it's not hot enough to forge, but it is a good heat for taking out the hammer marks. So you never want to try to forge at that color, but you can take the hammer marks out for the most part. Okay, so we'll take another heat. You've heard the expression, strike while the iron's hot. Of course, that came out of a blacksmith shop because that's the world we live in. You get the piece hot, you don't waste it around. Waste time, skin it around, bring it out, you smite it, when it cools down, get it back in the fire. In the, old, the old time masters wouldn't have had a way to know what each of those colors represents that black, red, cherry, orange, yellow, white. We know today what those colors represent as far as temperature. The metal won't show any color at all from black until it goes to red at about 1200 degrees. Then it goes up from there to white heat is about 2,400 degrees Fahrenheit. So you don't need to know the, color, the temperature, and that's what's so amazing about iron and steel is when it gets hot, it changes those colors. So I can very readily know the time that is malleable enough to forge it by looking at the color. Again, I'm just forging that down just a little bit at that black heat. Doesn't take long for a small piece to get hot, but it doesn't take long to heat it back up either. I'm gonna punch a hole in that. I think I told you I was making a hook, but if not, that's what we're making. Sometimes people come in and say, Mr. Blacksmith, what are you making? And I sometimes say, about 30 cents an hour. Because in the 1890s, that's what a blacksmith would have made in this territory, this uh, part of the state, the state I'm in, Colorado was. But um, that was a good living, 30 cents an hour. That's over $3 a day in most cases. And so a blacksmith, a skilled blacksmith has always made a good living. And they still, to, they still do today. But some of the blacksmiths I know today they make closer to $100, $150 an hour. Okay, so that little slug is hanging on there. I don't know if you can see it. What I was really doing when I was punching that hole was shearing the metal. Started in the beginning. Started on the front. And then I turned it over and hit the little dimple 
and then drove the slug out. On a thin piece, you can do that when it's cold. You don't have to heat that up. So we'll heat this, uh, we'll turn this around, heat the other part of it. As I say, we make all our own hand tools. So all these tongs we've made that would just fit like a thin tube. So let's change that. This looks like a better pair, yes. <laughs> so you can hear and see the results of when I turn this blower. I discovered thousands of years ago that uh, they used charcoal as common use of first. Learned to make hardwood, charcoal out of hardwood, and then force air into it. They get the super heat that they need in order to make this metal malleable so that they can make things out of it. This is a real easy way to do that. People always say, Mr. Blacksmith, are you hard of hearing? And I always say, what? Um, actually, the old blacksmiths that I know, they don't seem to be any hard of hearing than anybody else that's in their 80s. I kind of think, my, well, my theory is, it's kind of like if you were to shoot a gun, if you're in front of it, it's going to be a lot louder than if you're behind it, it seems like. My theory, and this isn't proven, but I think that as I smite that metal, sounds going out there, it's probably not hitting me as much. Doesn't make a lot of sense, but that's my theory. Mr. Morris, we have a question about the writing up here okay. on the flu. Well, what I'll do is, uh, you know, I was working out some, some mathematics here. Um, all you kids that don't like math, I wish I'd paid more attention to geometry. Geometry is amazing. Things like figuring out the circumference on a ring. How do you figure that out? How do you figure out uh, the golden mean? How do you figure out diameters and radiuses and what do all those things mean? Why are they important? Well, I use that stuff all the time. And so I was up here, I was actually trying to figure out the, uh, the amount of metal that I needed for that collar to go around these two pieces. And the formula is the perimeter plus two and a half times the thickness of the collar material. Pretty simple math, but without that, I'm guessing. I'm making each one of these and trying to fit it on there. Once you figure things like that out, simple. Okay, let's get this piece, we'll forge this out. Some of you may be really paying attention. And there at the end, when I was straightening that out and getting rid of the hammer marks, I wasn't taking my hammer like this, working my way along. My hammer was in one place. And I was moving that piece underneath the hammer. That makes it so you're a whole lot more accurate. Instead of moving the hammer all over, you move this piece. There's a saying that the right hand is labor and the left hand is management. This right arm is just swinging the hammer. This left hand is moving the piece, in a lot of cases, where it needs to be. I used to have an apprentice, and I called him Lightning, because he never hit in the same place twice. And it didn't work out having him in my shop, because every time I turned my back, he made a bolt for the door.
hang with me. I've got a bunch of them. Is there a particular reason that you hammer at different places on the anvil? There is, and that's, I was hoping somebody would ask that. Let me take advantage of this heat, and then we'll talk about that. Now that's not the hook, that's the curl for the hook. So where I was a moment ago was right here. And we'll quickly talk about the parts of this anvil. This is called an anvil. I was right here a moment ago. This has a radius to it. So when I was hitting on the piece here to draw it out, that radius makes the metal move quicker. And then I brought it over here to this part of the anvil and I could flatten those ridges, if you will. So that's one reason why I was using this. And we can talk about the names of this real quick. Um, the whole thing's called an anvil. This is an old timey anvil. It's a Peter Wright anvil made in England. And I've got a book on anvils and I forget what year this one was made, but based on the markings I could tell. And this is a three piece anvil. This piece from here down was forged. Then this piece up here was forged and then forge welded together. We can talk about that. I'm gonna do a forge weld in a minute. And then the top plate, is steel. This is wrought iron, and this top plate was welded on top. Three piece anvil. The difference between iron and steel, by the way, there's no difference in the color, but there's a difference in the content of carbon. That's what makes iron into steel when you add carbon. 1% carbon is considered high carbon, so it doesn't take much, very little. 1% is considered high carbon steel. The thing about steel is a hold its shape if it's hardened and tempered. If it's too hard, if it's all it, if all it is is hardened, the face of this anvil would chip off. It'd be too hard, too brittle. So then you use heat to remove some of that hardness, some of the brittleness rather, but leave the hardness, if that makes sense. That was a well-kept secret, by the way, for centuries. A blacksmith would not have explained to somebody in medieval times, for instance, how to harden and temper things, because those were trade secrets. And the blacksmith guilds in the, uh, in, the, in medieval times, for instance, were extremely powerful. And if you gave away trade secrets, the penalty was death. They were very serious about not giving away trade secrets. So similar today here in Colorado Springs, we have a lot of military. We have NORAD and we have Peterson Air Force Base and Schriever and all these places. Say you worked there and you had all kinds of secrets for, for the defense of our country and you went around blabbing that to people, then it'd be the same kind of defense they would not take kindly to that. So let's talk about the anvil real quick. This, I'd say, looks kind of like a horn. Guess what it's called? It's called a horn. This kind of is flat like a table. Guess what it's called? Table. This looks like a step. Take a guess. It's called a step. This is kind of flat like a ledge. Guess what it's called? No, it's called a face. Everybody thought ledge. Then this hole here is called the hardy hole, and the round hole is called the pritchell hole. Now you know the parts of the handle. Let's get back to this piece. So remember earlier I talked about, we use all four elements, earth, air, fire, and water. I've got a slack tub over here. I've got a wooden bucket sitting in it because I didn't, uh, of course, that being a wooden bucket, it's going to dry out and not hold water. But let's get that out of the way now. The water makes the staves on that bucket, of course, swell. So it'll stay tight. So I'll get that out of the way. But I use that water. A lot of times people think that when I'm done blocksmithing, making a piece, that I automatically chunk it in the water. I rarely ever put it in the water unless I, I want to harden it. Because when I'm done forging, I just throw it on the ground and let it air cool. It's called normalizing. If you were to take a piece of steel and stick it in that water, like say I'm making a chisel, I forge it out, chunk it in the water, and then I start using it, that's an example of a very dangerous tool because it could be that when I quench it, it made it really brittle. And then I'm over here striking it with a hard hammer, a piece could fly just like a bullet. And that's where you would temper it. You never just harden. There are certain shows on TV showing people making knives, and they stick it in the oil and say, I'm done. That's horrible. I should get a hold of those people and say, you're doing a tremendous disservice to those people that are watching that don't understand and maybe want to go home and make a knife 
because when you dunk it in that oil, now it's brittle. And that knife could break or cause a problem or maybe send a piece flying. You always harden and temper. You can look up what that means. Okay, so I'm going to use water. Well, let me ask you this question. I already gave away the answer. I want to hit that curl, but I don't want to flatten the curl. I tried to make a nice curl. I have to hit the curl to make it go around the horn. So what I'm going to do is stick just the curl in the water. So now I can smite that and back behind it. Here's another example of using the horn. And I can make that hook and not flatten the curl by simply cooling it. Now, as far as the function of this hook, I'm done. We have a way to hang it on the wall. And we have a way to hang something on it. The curl looks nice, but it also has a purpose. If I just left that pointed up instead of curled, if you hung a heavy garment on that, for instance, it might poke through. So that curl actually has a function. It also makes it look nice. Also, in the beginning, when I tapered that, do you see how that makes a nice looking curl? Modern tools, the metal is just cut and they bend it in this really ugly little catch that brings around the hook. I wouldn't walk across the street to look at an ironwork like that, but you can tell right off that if something has a hole punched in it, you can tell that hasn't been drilled, it was punched. If the, the taper for the curl, if you can see it, you know then that's forged. So I could stop right now with this hook, put it on the ground, go to our next project, or I can make it fancy. Now in 30 years, whenever I've asked people, do you want me to leave it plain or fancy, I've never had anybody say leave it plain. So let's go ahead, I'm reading your minds, and we'll heat this up, and we'll do something to make it kind of fancy. It won't have anything to do with the function, we have all the form for this hook. I'm sorry, we have all the functions for this hook. And now I want to do something just because it pleases me to make it look a little nicer. There was a fellow that came to my shop the other day, rode a horse went up, a stranger. And the dog's out there and he asked me, because the dog's growling and he says, does your dog bite? And I said, no. And he got down off the horse. And that dog grabbed his pant leg and ripped a big piece out of his trousers. And the guy jumped on his horse, his horse is dancing around. He gets control of his horse and he's pretty upset. And he says, I thought you said your dog doesn't bite. I said, he doesn't, that's not my dog. Later, I can tell you the one about the spotted goat if you'd like to hear that. Let's get back to this. Let me, let me get my, Monkey wrench, this was designed by a blacksmith. I put a handle on it because I'm gonna use it in a moment. But it was designed by a blacksmith, an American blacksmith, I believe. I think his name was, uh, his name was spelled M-O-N-C-K-E, I believe. And people called it monkey. Kind of like monkey words, the uh, department store. A lot of people call it that instead of McDunley words. So we got our tool ready. We'll come over to my vise. I've got two vices, this one and that one. This one's alcohol and that one's tobacco. You hadn't heard that one before, had you, Miss Cowan? I had not. No kidding. No kidding. Let's see how simple that was. But look how it makes it look nice. Now we'll squeeze it in the vise. If uh, I think we got it pretty true, pretty plumb, but let's see. We'll squeeze it in there. Okay. You brought me good luck. I think it turned out. So we've got to keep working to make a living. So let's heat another piece up. And again, I'm gonna throw it right there and we'll hope Miss Cowan doesn't step on it. So she's gonna burn the sole on her fancy cowboy boots. I'm gonna make a 
Let's make another hook if you don't mind. We'll make it out of that. I'll show you an example of what I want to make. This is a smaller version. I want to make a larger version of that out of this straight 3 8 inch round bar. Let's get started. This, by the way, was taught to me by a blacksmith from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. His name was Jim Jenkins, and that was probably, oh, 12 or 14 years ago. I was down in Louisiana, and I heard about a blacksmith, and I went to his shop, and it was late in the day, and he was closing up his shop. We got to talking, and we, we decided to meet up for dinner. And so while we were eating, he asked me if I'd ever made a heart hook, and I told him I had, but I didn't like doing it. The process wasn't much fun. It was a lot of work for what you ended up with. And I asked him if he ever did, and he said, yeah, and I asked him how. And so what I'm going to do now is what he taught me, and I'm forever grateful that, I, that he showed me this because I enjoy making these, and it's kind of a surprise in how, it's, how I make them. You might be surprised anyway, so let's get it hot. If you were in the room with us, you could smell the sulfur being burned off the coal. A lot of people say that smells like fireworks. And gunpowder, originally one of the ingredients, was charcoal. Speaking of coal, Mr. Morris, where do you get the coal from? Well, believe it or not, I have to order the good coal. I use bituminous coal. What you see in rail cars going down when you're stopped at the railroad crossing in a 100, uh, 100 car train goes by and it's full of coal. Unfortunately, that's not the kind of coal I use. It is coal, but that's anthracite. I use bituminous coal. I have to order this good coal from back east. It comes out of Pennsylvania and West Virginia. In Colorado, down by Trinidad, I had a friend who since passed, who uh, Leroy Jacobs said that down around Trinidad, there's about 350 million tons of good bituminous coal, but they're not mining it now. A lot of those mines have shut down or they couldn't get to them because they filled with water. It would be just so great for us to be able to go down there and pick up a few tons of coal but for next to nothing. I have to really spend money for this coal. There is a lot of, there used to be a lot of coal mining in Colorado. And years ago, a lot of the blacksmiths I know talked about, they would go get, you know, coal for $35 a ton. I have to pay more than that for a 50 pound bag of coal. I pay about $36 for a 50 pound bag of good bituminous coal. It breaks my heart to think about that. How at a time when it was very, very inexpensive, but a lot of modern blacksmiths use gas. They don't use coal. They use uh, propane. And they have forges that you kind of turn them on just like you do your barbecue grill if you have a gas grill open up the tank, push a button, and it lights it up. And it makes a lot of noise and it blows the heat straight out at you instead of going up the chimney. I don't like those forges. I wasn't taught to use those forges. Uh, Francis Whitaker was the man that taught me the most and he only used coal. Okay, what are we making? We're making that heart hook. So what part of the anvil am I at? Am I at here? Another example of using, you got a mark here, I got a meat. Another example of using the, the horn, yep. If any of you are blacksmiths out there, I guess it's okay if you take this idea and start making these. Because I've made hundreds of these since the day I met Mr. Jenkins, and you don't see many around the shop. They've all been sold. Okay, so I'm about to do something that I think is magic, and I'm going to fuse, fuse this back onto itself. <clears throat> What I've done here is I've drawn out and put a scarf on that piece of metal, something like that. 
I'm going to hit right there and I'm going to fuse it together if you bring me good luck. So when I'm done, this will look like that. They won't be stuck together if I do it right, it'll be fused. If you were to cut that with a hacksaw, you would see the grain in the metal and if it's welded correctly, there's no seam. And you know then it's welded right. The tricky part about welding, and it's probably the hardest thing to learn in blacksmithing, um, is you have to have heat right on the two or however many pieces you're welding. You have to have it heated the same on both pieces. You have to bring it out, you have to hit it in the right spot, and you have to hit it quickly because when I weld like this, I'm only gonna actually be welding maybe about three seconds. I'll keep forging it if it's welded because I wanna shape it, but if it doesn't weld, I'm gonna stop. Every time you miss a weld, it gets harder, harder to weld it. So I wanna get it right. I'm gonna put some flux on this metal, and the flux, what it does, just generally speaking, this flux has a little bit of iron filings in it. It's borax with some iron filings. I have some plain borax right there. It's got some soot in it, but that's just like you buy at the store. What that does, it melts over the metal and basically cleans the metal. Okay, so that's a good heat. I'm going to throw some flux on there, and again, that cleans the metal. Because if you were paying attention while I was forging, there's the stuff that comes off the anvil that I'm either brushing off or blowing it off the anvil. And that's called scale. I got some soot in there too. But this example is scale. When that's on my anvil, I'm always brushing it off. That comes off the metal. So when I bring it out of the superheat of that forge, the moment I bring it out, the oxygen is creating scale on the piece. If I'm trying to weld something, that scales in there, it's kind of like skin. Um, and it makes the weld hard to get. So I put some flux on it. As the piece of metal heats up, it melts and looks wet and kind of glassy. That way when I hit it, it should be pretty clean. It doesn't help stick it or anything like glue. Okay, so I'm watching carefully the color of the piece of metal right now, it's a light orange. I need to bring it right up to that white color right before it starts to burn. When it's at that color, the surface of that metal is kind of sticky. And then if I smite it in the right place and I do it quickly, we'll see if we can get it well. We're in a yellow color right now. I'm looking down in the fire. Again, if I let it get too hot, it's going to burn, and then it won't weld. It may even cut the piece in half. You see a few sparks coming out of the fire. I think we're good. Okay, I'm done welding now. I'm just forging it now. You can see, once again, I'm on the horn of the handle. You see that scale, that black stuff that's on the metal, and you see where it's come off the, under the anvil. Let me brush that off. And if there's any doubters out there across the world that wonder if that's welded, you can see for yourself. You brought me good luck. Okay, well, let's get it back to the fire. Mr. Morris, can you tell us a little bit more about that hand cranked blower and the advantages of that okay. particular blower? Well, what this is basically is a fan. On the other side, there's an opening. You can see the fin spinning as I turn this. But I have gears in this blower inside that housing. So as I turn it at, say, one R, well, let's say I'm turning it at, say, 30 RPMs, this handle, 30 revolutions per minute. Inside there, it might be 300 revolutions a minute. I'm only guessing, but that gives, that illustrates that I'm turning this pretty, pretty slowly. I can do this all day uh, without getting tired. But the fan inside here is blowing the air through that tube and it comes up underneath the fire. Now we have, a lot of blacksmith shops had bellows at the time of 1890s. But again, these, these were an example of something being mass produced. Now you're looking at one of our bellows. 
and you crank on that handle, and that's a double chambered bellows so that when you pull on that handle that's running kind of horizontal above it, it isn't just a puff for every time you pull the handle down. It's got two, it's got a chamber in it. So it blows air constantly. A good bellows, let me see if I can get it going. I think we've got a tear in the top. Yeah, I can see we have a tear. I haven't used this in a while. But basically, as I squeeze, as I pull that down, it squeezes the bottom up, but then lifts the top. So when I bring this back up, gravity's making the top go down. So it's a constant blast of air. A well-made set of bellows is really pretty delightful to use. It's, it doesn't do a job any less uh, well as the blower. And I, understood in the, I understand that in the beginning, when they came out with this type of a blower, they actually had handles on them. And they had a rocker arm with belts because the blacksmith was so used to pulling up and down on a bellows. He didn't want it. They didn't start out making the circular motion right away. The next generation probably thought it was OK. Okay. Isn't that a pretty color? See all that scale that's come off? With that handle. Uh oh. Did I get distracted? <clears throat> what did I do? Miss Allen, I'm going to. Uh, well, this is on video live. So. Maybe you're the witness seeing the blacksmith not paying attention. That doesn't look like a heart to me. Is that hook that I made on the floor, is that still hot? I would say probably. It is, it's still a little bit warm. Okay. Now I'm going to take this cut off and I'm going to put it in this square hole. Do you remember what I called that? Party hole. It's a wonderful invention. They didn't design that in the beginning. In the beginning, well, the original anvil was probably a rock, and the man hit it against a piece of uh, meteorite between a river rock, and he thought, "Wow, this is this is interesting material. Wonder what it is." And then they learned how to make iron and steel, and of course, the anvil was a, a very important tool to use for forging. But they didn't start out looking like this. That's the iconic shape of what Americans think of as an anvil. But after they started making anvils out of iron and steel, the first ones are basically just a block. It didn't have the horn, didn't have the hardy hole, didn't have the pritchel hole, wasn't, didn't have this waist. The design of this anvil, by the way, watch this hammer. You see all that spring? So when I'm really swinging my hammer, when I'm coming down and hitting, my hand is very loose when I hit so that the shock doesn't go up my arm and it also allows that hammer to rebound. So all I'm doing is snapping my hand right here. It's loose and I come down and I snap, but then it's loose there and comes up. And the only way you learn to do that is by doing it wrong. When I first started, I hurt my arm. It was probably three months. I couldn't hardly lift a cup of coffee because I was doing it wrong. Okay. This is when we'll learn if that forge well is actually a good weld or not. Because I'm putting a lot of stress right down there by doing this. Don't ever forget to take that back out when you're working on that part. And Now, I don't see a heart there, but that's kind of a nice shape. You do a lot with that. Put it along a, along a fence. Maybe have that on the top and a small poker, and that on the top and a small poker. That'd keep people from climbing over. 
Okay. What is it? I'm making making that heart. Let's see. Let's see if we have any success here. So Mr. Morris, you've been turning that blower today. Would that have always been the case or would someone else perhaps have turned the blower for you? We have a question about what does apprenticeship look like? Well, an apprentice would be doing that if I had an apprentice. Um, generally in America, a, a young boy would become an apprentice maybe by the time he was 13 and an apprenticeship might last three to five years. Of course, during, when you're an apprentice, you don't get paid, but you're working right alongside the blacksmith. In a lot of cases, it was the blacksmith's son. His, his dad was the blacksmith, so he learned, and his son's learning, and then so on. But if it was somebody he didn't know, it was a big deal for a family if their son was chosen to be a blacksmith in a lot of cases, because if they knew that if that young person stayed with it, worked hard and learned, didn't quit, that then he could become a blacksmith and he'd make a good living and be respected and everybody in town would know him and they'd be glad that he was there. So start out as an apprentice, you'd turn the blower, you'd swing the sledgehammer, you'd drill holes, you'd file metal, you'd put the metal up on the rack, you'd take the horse and meet the train, bring the material back, you'd maybe deliver things to people. Um, most of the time they'd come to the shop, but sometimes you would maybe on the way home drop something off, drop off a plowshare for your neighbor who's a farmer and so on. After your apprenticeship, you became what was called a journeyman. And I understand it meant that what you would do is you would journey to other blacksmith shops and ask if they needed help. A journeyman received a small amount of money, but he was basically leaving the smith that he learned from so he could learn from so many other people, just like in college or high school or whatever, you don't have one teacher generally. You have a lot of teachers and they're teaching you different things. So a journeymanship might be five to seven years, sometimes longer, and then you could have a shop. Now, it's important to note that in the United States, it was, there was never a guild. There was never a blacksmith guild. In some cases, a guy would have a shop. He'd put a sign out front, say, blacksmith shop, open. And then people would come to him, and if he could make what they wanted, they, they'd keep coming back. If they didn't, he'd go out of business. In medieval times, you couldn't be a blacksmith unless you went through that training. They were very serious about that. Okay, let's get this. I need to take a good heat on this next part, so don't look away. This is the fun part. Beautiful heat. We got a little perfect right here. Hold your applause until we're done. Okay. So again, if you've ever heard the expression form follows function, I'm doing this the opposite. I'm making a nice shape, but it has no function. This is, I mean, if you put this on the wall, you'd say, Great, but what is it? What does it do? So I need to do a couple things. What do you think I ought to do? Well, I need to punch two holes so that we can mount that hook up on the wall. Then I need to taper it, make it curl, and then I need to make a hook. So let's get that going, because I know that you're not gonna be here all day. And always time flies in a blacksmith shop. And I'm always so surprised when I say, when I find out, I mean, I've been in a blacksmith shop and been working on something and I literally look up and realize it's dark and then I haven't eaten lunch and supper and I like to eat. But there's times when you're in the flow, which is a term they use, I guess, where you lose track of everything around you. And that's, uh, that's, that happens with me in the blacksmith shop. I love blacksmithing. So there's an example of another, another use of the anvil. I'm using the edge to make a shoulder, if you will. Now I'll drive that slug out of there. So we'll have a hole.
Okay, let's do it on the other side. <clears throat> I was up near Victor, Colorado with my friend Don Hansen, and Victor is a mining community here west of Colorado Springs, up near, closer to Pikes Peak. We're up there walking around, and we came across this big hole in the ground, and we're both looking into the hole. We can't see the bottom. And so, of course, naturally, we're thinking, let's throw something in there and see how deep that hole is. And we go looking around, he walks over there, comes out with an anvil, comes up to the edge of the hole, and before I can stop him, he throws the anvil in the hole. And we're both listening, and here comes a spotted goat, jumps right in the hole. We're like, what just happened? Well, but a few minutes later, this big fella came walking along. He's wearing a pair of coveralls, got a straw hat. He's chewing on a twig. And uh, he says, howdy, boys. He said, have you seen my spotted goat? And we go, sir, you wouldn't believe it, but he jumped into the hole. He said, boys, that's impossible. I had him tethered to an anvil. That's burning my hand a little bit. Okay. Man. Okay, look here. We've got a way to hang it. We've got no way to hang anything on it. So, moving right along. Let's make that hook. So I'm gonna cut that bar off because it looks silly to have the hook at the heart up here and the hook way down here. So. As I blacksmith over the years, I've learned more and more about design. And I'm married to a woman who teaches design at the college level, and she doesn't cut me any slack. I'll make something here. Let me show you an example. Look at that beautiful, priceless roasting fork that I made. Saw that in an Italian book on ornate ironwork. I made that and brought it home and showed her, and she said, Well, that's nice. I said, to myself, she doesn't know anything about ironwork. I don't care what she thinks. But I asked her, what's wrong with it? She goes, your proportions are all off. That's in the dead center. Should be, haven't you ever heard of the golden mean? One to 1.618? I said, come again. So I've learned. And so to the human eye, this smaller version is supposed to be more pleasing because this is 1.618 and this is one. So you start learning about design. I mean, this hook that I'm making, I'm not gonna make that hook way down low that lip dump. So I can just hear her voice in the back of my head. So, I will cut this off. I didn't get it real hot, but let's go ahead. never cut all the way through into that hardy hole. You notice I scored that around the, all sides. So now I should be able to break that off. I hope Miss Cowan doesn't step on it. Let's make, uh, let's make that, eat this up too. I may not have time to make that. Where did time go? I think, Mr. Morris, if you finish that heart hook, and then maybe for those who want to stick around, give them a little bonus of, of seeing that really neat um, handle that I know you okay. were planning on well, showing. If folks want to hang around, I'd be, they caught me in a good mood today. So I'd be happy to work a little extra. Uh, generally, when you come to, uh, to Rockledge Ranch for adults, it's $8 admission. You can go to our website, Rockledge Ranch, Dot com and learn more. And by the way, we're super excited to announce that we will be open this summer starting June 3rd. So come out and see us. Come visit Colorado Springs. Uh, drive up the top of Pikes Peak. Go to Garden of the Gods and so on. Um, but anyway, it's $8 for adults, but I feel I'll give you the uh, $10 show of the day.
if that's okay with you. So look where I'm at again. Watch out. Okay, see that nice taper we were talking about? That will help me make that curl because the end of the curl is going to be the tightest and it also makes it look nice like we talked about before. I mean, when you really think about it, Miss Cowan, is there any reason to doubt why there are poems written about blacksmiths? In your case, I'd have to say no. I didn't expect you to be nice. Okay, the curl, does it go to the front or the back? That's right, it goes to the back. Because the hook, the hook comes to the front. Now, we'll bring the hook to the front. What do I have to do so I don't smash the curl? If you give me a second, I'm not, I'm not happy with that curl. Had a little bit of a flat spot. Okay, now we'll, so you remember what I have to do? In this case, yes, I'm gonna use the water. Cool, just the curl, so I can smite the curl. Now watch. See how I didn't flatten the curl? Looks like we got it straight. I wish you all would come back again. Bring me all this good luck. So. There we have it. Save your applause until the end, please. So we could throw that in the water, but I'm gonna let it air cool. So I've got one other thing here that we may not run out of time. See, I was thinking ahead. I didn't have too many irons in the fire. I had one other iron in the fire. That's an expression that also came out of the blacksmith shop. Too many irons in the fire, going at it. Hammer and tongs, lose your temper. Uh, another one is a uh, man is like uh, steel. If he loses his temper, he loses his worth. There's a lot of them. So what I've done here, I took, I took four pieces of metal, four round bars, three eighths inch, and I forge welded them together. Can you see how like a piece of clay, I'm welded that together. Didn't weld it in the middle. I turned it around, welded it again, and this one I drew out to a point. Then I took that and I scarfed the end. I haven't scarfed the end yet. And I haven't scarfed the end on that yet. But imagine a scarf is like two little hands. I'm gonna turn them over like that and weld it on the end there. 
then that becomes part of that bar. Then the top part, I made a curl and I made a hook. And that's where I'm at with this piece that I made before you showed up today. Let me show you what I've got. There's that piece welded here. There's that pointy part with a curl and a hook. The middle has not been welded. What do you think is going to happen to that? What can I do to it? Well, let me show you. Do we have a few minutes? I think everyone's going to want to see what you can do. So let's take the little bit of time we have. Come out to the Rockledge Ranch and see how that ends up. We got people flying in from all over the world, wouldn't we? For you. Miss Callan, the lady, the voice of the lady behind the camera, maybe you met her when we first started. But she's the lead interpreter here at Rockledge Ranch. And I must say, on camera, I'm a very lucky person to have her on the staff. And we work together and we do some really great programs out here. She's kind of like a little action figure. She never seems to get tired. And so she's a big part of why we're successful out here at Rockledge Ranch. We have an office manager by the name of Andrea Tappan, and I've got two maintenance guys, John Winters and John Hewitt. In the summer, we hire 15 more people. We have 100 or so junior docents, and we have dozens of adult docents. So we're really rocking and rolling. And Andrea and Melissa are the ones that really help all those programs. Okay, watch this. You know what I better do? Let's uh, cool that part. <clears throat> you might want to stand over there. Okay, let me brush the scale off of that. I don't quite have the heat right down there that I want, but I'm gonna leave it in interest of having you see the end of this. Now we could leave that right there, and that looks pretty neat, doesn't it? Other than the fact that that's not oriented to the end of the bar, but right now I don't care about that. See what I mean? That's turned this way about 90 degrees, and that's almost vertical. So we're going to take another heat. Okay, get a little, I want to squeeze that together slightly. Try to make it even. I'm always having to fiddle with it. Sometimes people say, leave it alone. You got a little space there I don't like. What I can do is heat that back up and we'll fix that slightly. Now the nice thing about that type of handle, besides I think it's really a pretty handle, I've got an example here and my fireplace tool. With that also, a lot of lid lifters on 
wood burning stoves have a, a coil like that and that's so that if it's left on the stove if it were solid it'd get hot and it'd really take a long time to cool and probably burn your hand this lets the air through it so it doesn't get as hot given the same amount of time and also if you notice how it fits in my hand so nice so this is called a basket handle and there's a function to it as well as a form that i really like so that's how that's an example of that that's going to bug me that space so i'm going to keep that back up do we have any more time okay well i'll tell you what uh, i want to leave you with a quote from will rogers there's a shrine here uh, above the Cheyenne Mountain Zoo, a shrine to Will Rogers, and if you're not sure who he is, look him up. But he had a quote that I, that I really liked, and he said, uh, I'm gonna read it to you so I don't mess this up. He said, know what you are doing. These are the, I should say, these are the three things, the secret to success. And his first one, he said, know what you're doing. The second one is, love what you're doing. And the third one is, believe in what you're doing. So I think that, kind of sums it up. That's the way I feel about blacksmithing. Hey, I really enjoyed having you here today. I'm going to get back to this piece and make it right because 500 years from now, if somebody were to look at that and I wonder if they're going to say, I wonder what this material is. Oh, that's that old fashioned stuff. It's called iron. Um, I wouldn't want them to look at that and say, I wonder why you didn't take an extra heat and fix it. So I'm going to spend a moment to do that. But I appreciate you coming by. Come by and see us here at Rock Ledge Ranch this summer and take care of yourselves. Can so, I ask um, one last question of you, Mr. Morris? We've sure. had a question about if there are any local resources for learning how to blacksmith. Well, we, uh, myself and uh, buddy Don Hansen, we teach a blacksmith beginners class uh, every spring. Um, no, I'm sorry, we would have already had it. We had to cancel it and it was springtime. It would have, already, we would have already had it. Um, there are other blacksmith schools. There's one up in Berthoud. There's an organization called Rocky Mountain Smiths that I really encourage you to look up, uh, get involved with. It's a great organization of blacksmiths along the Front Range and all over Colorado. They give demonstrations, they sell tools, they have an extensive library that you can borrow books and videos and things from. So there are, you're gonna have to do a little bit of research. This year is a little dicey because normally there would be places I could send you, but those places right now are, aren't open. So if you're interested, I encourage you to keep this chain, from 3,000 years ago going by keeping every generation having somebody that wants to do this, that would make me really happy. And come by and see me and I'd be happy to answer your questions.